We're lucky to have Dr. Sri Chai come join us today uh, on short notice to talk about this. It's probably just like everything in COVID evolving. Um, I guess, Dr. Sri Chai, you're, you're, besides being a cardiologist, your expertise is mostly in, in non-invasive imaging, including echo and cardiac MRI. Is that correct? Uh, yep, non-invasive imaging, um, MR, CT, nuclear, echo. A little bit of everything then. Exactly. <clears throat> and I think, you know, maybe you could start also by telling us the kind of cardiology department's experience right now with COVID, because I, my understanding is maybe the only, you're the only one here right now, and you guys are all kind of bouncing back and forth between hospital center or something like that? So most of our team has been deployed over at hospital center um, in the EDs over there, um, into the other ICUs, I'm told, over there. Although I think similar to here, I think um, things are, seem like they're leveling. Um, and so maybe, maybe, maybe things will hopefully slowly, we'll see more, more of the cardiologists come back here. But right now it's been just either me or Jose covering the service here, the inpatient services. And our outpatient services, most of our um, providers have been doing telemedicine either from home or some people do come in, but a lot of our patients have been uh, doing the video or phone visits, I think just like they have upstairs in um, internal medicine, if I, if, I'm, if, I, if I remember correctly, that's what's going on there as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we're all crossing our fingers that it's flattening off. Uh, but with that, I'll let you take it over. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about COVID-19 cardiovascular complications. And I think as uh, Dr. Fisher had mentioned, there's, it's been sort of a hot topic these, um, these days. There's been a lot in the news. A lot of my patients have been asking me about this. Um, and so I thought I would kind of approach the, my talk a little bit sort of with questions that patients have asked me or other people have asked me or questions that I've had and seeing what is out there right now in the literature. As you can see from these headlines, there's a lot that we still don't really know about what is going on in the heart in these patients. So first question, so are patients with cardiovascular disease more likely to get COVID? So is there something inherently about having heart disease that makes them more likely to catch the disease? Um, this is a meta-analysis that looked at six studies. This is all Chinese, uh, Chinese um, cohorts and looked at the presence of cardiovascular comorbidities in these cases. And if you look at the pooled data here at the bottom, so this is about 1,500 patients, and we see that the prevalence of hypertension is about 17%, diabetes almost 10%, and um, cerebral and cardiovascular disease 16%. The authors kind of comment that the problems of hypertension and diabetes is actually similar to what's seen in the general population in China, but that cardiac and cerebral disease seems to be increased in um, the COVID uh, population compared to what's seen in the general population, suggesting that there may be sort of something about uh, cardiac and cerebral disease that um, um, makes those patients more likely to, um, to get the disease. If we look now at uh, data from the US, and this is published every week, um, this particular data set is uh, for cases from the month of March, encompassing about 14 states. And if we look at the prevalence here, hypertension, overall about 50%, <clears throat> and they kind of break it up by the age group. So sort of a reflection of uh, the different um, age groups or what's playing into the overall number. Cardiovascular disease, about 28%, and if we look specifically coronary disease, 14%, and heart failure, 7%. So how does that compare with our um, general population? It's probably, with hypertension, probably this, it's also very similar to our general population. Unfortunately, the age groups don't really match with the age groups that um, have been reported in our um, annual statistics of heart disease and stroke. But um, if we look here, we see the gradation as with increasing age. Um, 18%, 50%, 70, um, 73%, and it probably parallels that what we see in our, um, in our general population as well. And then if we look at cardiovascular disease, um, and I think the population that's reported um, in this circulation um, statistics is, also includes um, cerebrovascular disease, but if, so the numbers are a little bit higher, but it probably is also compared to the general population, also probably pretty similar prevalence. 
So if I have to go back and I and my patients ask me these questions, you know, so are you know, since I have heart disease, am I more likely to get COVID-19? I think we can pretty much say it seems like no. It seems like that does it's like just because you have heart disease, that doesn't necessarily mean you're more likely to um, get catch the virus compared to um, to other people. The prevalence is probably very similar to what's in the general population. So do COVID-19 patients who have underlying cardiovascular disease, do they end up having more severe disease? In this um, study of about 138 patients um, from Wuhan, China, they looked at patients um, in the ICU versus non-ICU and looked at the presence of comorbidities. And they did show that hypertension almost doubled the um, prevalence in the ICU compared to non-ICU um, patients, cardiovascular disease similarly, and cerebrovascular disease 17 17% versus 1%, although the number is very small. So it does seem like there's an increased likelihood that if you do have underlying comorbidities that you are more likely to have, be admitted to the ICU and therefore have more severe disease. In this study, which um, included 191 patients and they looked at mortality, survivorship versus not, and the presence of comorbidities, and again, similarly, about double the effect um, in terms of if you had underlying high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary heart disease, um, that um, it was more, more associated with, um, with mortality compared to those who, who survived on. And if we look at kind of like the cohort, what's been reported now, of court about 45,000 patients in China. The overall case fatality rate was reported around 2.3%. And we can see here though, in the presence of um, specific cardiovascular disease, uh, the uh, case fatality rate is increased at 11%. It's actually higher than that of respiratory disease, which is reported around 6%. Hypertension also about 6%. Um, looking at the cohort that's been reported out of Italy, this is almost about 900 patients. They had a very similar case fatality rate, 2.3%, so similar to what's been reported overall in China. And that they noted that comorbidities were present in about 63% of the patients who had increased fatality. So back to this question. So if you have underlying cardiovascular disease, do you tend to have more severe disease with COVID? And I think the answer would be yes. All right, so the next question I hear, so do patients who have underlying cardiovascular disease, do they have increased evidence of heart injury or is it just, you know, purely just respiratory wise? Um, in this study, which included about 187 patients and they looked at troponin T levels as a marker of injury and they compared those who had normal levels compared to those who had elevated levels <clears throat> in the presence of comorbidities. Um, so first off in the cohort, there were about almost 30% of patients had an elevated troponin T level. So it is pretty, it is pretty common to see um, overall. And it is more frequent in men compared to, to, to women. And as would be expected, associated with increased age. Um, and then in terms of comorbidities, again, hypertension three times is likely to have elevated troponin levels. Coronary heart disease, um, 33% compared to 3% with the normal levels, and then cardiomyopathy as well. Diabetes um, also included there. So I think that from the data that we have, at least what has been reported, it does seem like that people who have underlying cardiovascular disease do have evidence of increased uh, cardiac injury when they um, are infected with the virus. All right, so are there, do these parameters, um, either cardiac parameters or biomarkers that we use, do they predict who's gonna develop more severe disease? Um, in this study of 138 patients, they did look at cardiac parameters such as heart rate, respiratory rate, and the mean arterial pressure in the ICU versus non-ICU patients. And the baseline cardiac hemodynamics did not seem to be predictive of the severity of the disease. However, we know there are a lot of laboratory values um, that are very that are, have been predicted of more severe disease. And when we look specifically at the cardiac um, biomarkers such as CKMB and hypersensitivity, um, sorry, elevated troponin levels, we see that there is a correlation that these elevated bio, myocardial injury markers are um, associated with um, more severe disease and in the study more likely to be admitted into the ICU 
This is a meta-analysis of about four studies that looked at the cardiac troponin levels in patients with severe versus mild COVID disease, and they looked at what the standard mean difference was between, um, between the two groups, and pooling all the cohorts was about a uh, delta value of about 20, 25. Um, in this study, they looked, again, this is a troponin, um, looking specifically at the troponin levels, and they looked to see if there was an increased incidence of complications. And again, it does seem that elevated troponins was more predictive of um, presence of AR ARDS, ventricular arrhythmias, coagulopathy, kidney disease, need for mechanical ventilation, and then um, overall death rate was increased in those with elevated troponin T levels. And then going back to the study that looks specifically at survivors versus non-survivors, again, high sensitivity troponin was um, shown to be higher um, or increased in patients who um, ultimately suffered um, uh, death from the, from the COVID. Um, in this study of about 416 patients, they looked at cardiac injury and in association with mortality in the hospitalized patients. This is um, from the Chinese data. And they showed that without cardiac injury, there was actually pretty good um, survival rate, but that when you have cardiac injury, and again, this is evidenced by elevated troponin levels predominantly, uh, survival rate significantly decreased. In this study, they looked at, um, so if you have elevated troponin rates, what about if you have underlying coronary disease or not? And how does that predictive of mortality? And as we can see on the curves here, the highest mortality was in those patients who had elevated troponins, but also had underlying cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, if you had elevated troponin and you didn't have cardiovascular disease, you also had high mortality rate, just not as high as the Un, if, as if you had underlying cardiovascular disease, but higher than those who had heart, heart disease, but a normal troponin value. So this kind of just, again, goes to speak that the elevated biomarker, uh, cardiac biomarkers were very predictive of, um, of injury and death. And then they went on to kind of show like a progression. So if you looked at patients who ultimately died from their disease, the troponin values actually increased um, over time, whereas in the patients who ended up being cured, even if they had a slightly elevated troponin, they tended to stay flat. Um, they also showed similar changes with uh, pro-BMP, although, it it, although during hospitalization it did increase, but then would show decrease in the um, pro-BMP levels. So I think in answer to this question, do these cardiac parameters or biomarkers predict who will develop more severe disease? I think the data that we have out there, at least from the Chinese data, we don't really have a lot here in the U.S. cohorts, but do suggest that it is very predictive. All right, so how frequently, though, is the heart implicated as the cause of death for patients? I didn't see a whole lot published on, on this. We always think, um, you know, the, the virus mostly affects the uh, lungs and we get ARDS and we get um, um, hypoxia. So how frequently is it that the um, cause of death was ultimately ruled to be heart or the heart was somehow implicated in it? And there was just one study I saw, and this was based on 150 cases in Wuhan, China. Um, there were 68 deaths. And this predominantly as expected, about 85% of them were due to respiratory failure. 7% um, were due primarily to myocardial damage or heart failure. And I think it comes up to about 40% kind of um, overall were implicated with some, some, el some elements of heart, um, heart damage, um, either alone or in combination with respiratory failure. So I think the number here, frequently the heart, heart's implicated about 40%. So now that we kind of have the background data and we know that if you have underlying heart disease, you probably are going to get more severe disease. The elevated biomarkers do seem predictive of more severe deaths. What's the underlying cause? What's going on here with these complications that we see in these patients? Um, so kind of looking at this, and there's unfortunately not a whole lot known exactly about what's going on here, but when we think about the risk factors that can cause cardiovascular complications, you know, having underlying CAD, we know we have the immune activation and shock going on, as well as metabolic disarray, coagulopathy, and also the patients tend to be more immobile. And sort of the complications that we 
see are arrhythmias, myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, venous thromboembolism, shock, and heart failure. This was um, a nice uh, study that was published uh, la late last month, kind of looking at potential effects of coronavirus on the cardiovascular system and sort of breaking up the sort of different things that the virus infections can cause and how it can lead ultimately to an increased risk for having a myocardial infarction, heart failure, or arrhythmias, and looking um, specifically at potential um, aspects of uh, virus infections, either direct vascular infection um, in the case of a myocardial infarction risk or um, direct um, infection of the my myocardium and causing um, myocarditis and heart failure risk or, and or arrhythmias. And then again, some of the other host of effects, the hypercoagulability, the cytokine storm, increased sympathetic sy stimulation, as well as um, decreased myocardial oxygen supply and increased myocardial oxygen demand and the play between the two, which uh, can then lead to cardiac injury. We know that cardiac dysfunction is common in patients who, um, who have sepsis, and is that what's going on here? So this, so this connection between cardiac dysfunction and sepsis, it was first described in a dog model in 1975 and then in a patient in 1981. <clears throat> the presence of cardiac dysfunction is associated with worsened prognosis. Um, there has been a relationship seen between elevated troponin levels in a septic patient with LV dysfunction and that the higher the troponin elevation is associated with increased risk of death. And if as we look around here about the kind of connection between um, sepsis and what leads into the myocardial dysfunction, a lot of these kind of um, proposed mechanisms are very similar to what's been proposed as to what's going on with the coronavirus infections. We also know that there's an increased risk of um, acute coronary syndromes and myocardial, myocardial infarction um, after acute infections. This was a study out of the UK uh, that looked at over 20,000 patients, and they looked at the influence of um, vaccination and infections, res respiratory tract infections or urinary tract infections, and then the um, incidence of myocardial infarction following um, the, um, the event. And, oops, sorry. So there wasn't really an association with vaccination and presence of MI, but um, both systemic respiratory tract infections and urinary tract infections both showed a correlation or association with presence of myocardial infarction, highest in the first one to three days after the infection, and higher in respiratory tract infections compared to urinary tract infections. Again, this was a UK study. Um, but this study was actually um, performed in the US it was looked at both inpatient and outpatient infections as a trigger of cardiovascular disease, um, specifically um, cerebrovascular and coronary heart disease. Uh, this was part of the ERIC study, which included a database from um, North Carolina, Mississippi, Minnesota, and Maryland. Um, and again, in this uh, study, they did show the dark dots are the inpatients and the, the circles are the outpatients, but they did show a correlation um, or association with um, coronary heart disease um, following an um, infection, either both in the inpatient or outpatient, although it was stronger in the inpatient setting. So those are all kind of like postulated mechanisms out there. What are we actually seeing? Um, what types of acute cardiac injuries have been seen or reported in patients who have COVID-19? So first I thought I'd go over a case that we were consulted on here at Georgetown. This was a 74-year-old African-American gentleman. He had known underlying heart disease, also had hypertension and prostate cancer, and he, came, he was admitted with um, typical symptoms for COVID and diagnosed um, leave on the 25th, got started on azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine on the 26th, was getting EKGs. He ended up getting intubated on the 28th due to worsening hypoxia. Um, we were consulted because of the EKG basically showing a significant change from his baseline EKG, suggesting ST elevations um, diffusely, but mostly in the anterior lateral, uh, anterior and lateral leads here. And this um, again, the EKGs were being obtained for um, daily QTC monitoring. The troponin that was measured at this time was less than 0.015. And this is very different, again, as I mentioned, from his baseline EKG, which happened to be done a month prior and is shown here, where it um, looks actually pretty normal. 
follow-up EKGs, we see a progression in the ST, um, STT wave changes. QTC was actually noted to become more prolonged, 551 here, and 543 here, and now we're getting the symmetrical, um, sorry, the deep T wave inversions we can see here. So progression of something, something's going on there. So we did an um, echocardiogram and the images are pretty limited, but there's a suggestion that the LV, this is the LV here, and this is the right ventricle. The right ventricle seems to be moving okay, but the left ventricle seems to be, I think we call it uh, mildly depressed and appeared to have more of an apical component to it. So it was suggestive of maybe Takotsubo um, cardiomyopathy or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. So azithromycin was discontinued because of the prolonged QT. The troponins actually only peaked at 0.328, um, very small peak, which again would go along with uh, reversible cardiomyopathy. Um, and then as I mentioned, the echo, which was performed on the 31st, was suggestive of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Patient had another um, small bump in his troponin for 0.424 and had a repeat echo, which actually showed that his LV function was improved which again goes again for, for a possible reversible cardiomyopathy, such as a Takasubo. Unfortunately, we didn't do any other kind of imaging other than echocardiograms. So looking at the literature, some of the other sites that have been reported um, have done a bit more um, um, other types of imaging or um, um, investigative studies to kind of understand a little bit better about what's going on here. Um, this is a study of, um, sorry, this is a case report that was um, published, I think, I can't remember, last month. Uh, a previously healthy 53-year-old Caucasian woman, <clears throat> she presented with symptoms of mainly fatigue um, and was diagnosed with COVID. She didn't have any chest pain. Um, her EKG on admission, as we can see here, showed, again, this diffuse ST elevation with some reciprocal depression. Um, and um, the patient underwent an echocardiography that showed regional wall motion abnormalities. They took the patient to the cath lab and she had coronary angiography that showed no significant coronary disease. Um, so then she got referred for an MRI. And I'm showing you the images here of a four chamber view um, to look better for myocardial tissue characterization. Um, stir imaging to look for myocardial edema, looking for bright areas in the heart muscle. T1 mapping, um, is another kind of character, myocardial characterization imaging. So the T1 um, values of the myocardium were elevated, which is a suggestive of either inflammation or, or, or an um, um, infiltrative process going on. And then late gadolinium enhancement, which the authors concluded, this is kind of a little bit bizarre image to me here, but the authors concluded were showing diffuse delayed enhancement as well as a pericardial effusion. And uh, their conclusion based on the imaging um, was that this was probably acute myopericarditis. This is another... Hey Barbara, a couple yeah. of quick questions for you. Yep. Um, just in that case, uh, Georgetown, that you mentioned, mm -hmm. was it similar to this case report that those SD changes were present on admission, or was that something that developed during the course? Um, unfortunately, that EKG I showed was the first EKG we had um, from, from admission, um, the prior EKG was prior to admission. So I don't, I don't have an admission EKG. Oh, I see. So, so some kind of symptom change prompted that while he was No, he was out. getting, I, I, I think because he got started on the um, azithro and hydro, hydroxychloroquine. Oh, I see. Because he then, was intubated. He didn't have some, he, I mean, it was hard to elicit symptoms. I think what mostly we're seeing on, at least on the floors, I don't know about the ICU, but is very similar to that case where the, the troponins are, you know, in the point one, you know, less than one, but they're elevated. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel like there's a certain threshold in, in this that we should be looking out for. Is there anything, because some of those studies looked like the ones that went to the ICU was in double digit troponin. Right, um, and again, I, so some of the troponin values you have to take uh, into account, and I didn't, I didn't specifically go, but sometimes they're reporting high sensitivity troponins versus conventional troponin values. Some of them are troponin T versus troponin I. So here right now we're doing a fourth generation troponin I. Um, so so just, just a mode about like comparing. So for example, this, um, this other case where I was gonna show, 
they were reporting um, high sensitivity troponin T values. So those are in like the 100 range. So, so I, I don't know, you have to make sure you're not, you, that you're, because it's a different um, unit value. I see. And so for our, the test here, the I, is there any, is it just any elevation is enough to say it's worth looking into or? Um, we usually, you know, if it's greater than, I mean, right now we're using the cutoffs greater than 99th um, percentile. Um, so I think for here, for our, for our values, it's like 0.045. Um, but obviously, it's not as um, specific or as sensitive as the high sensitivity troponins. And I think some of the other labs are using high sensitivity troponins. Just of note, we are supposed to go to the high sensitivity troponins. We were planning to go to it next month, and we have a protocol in place, but sort of been put on hold a little bit because of um, everything else going on in our, in our system at this point in time. I'm told our go live date may be June. Um, and so this is, we haven't gotten to the point of this education about the high sensitivity, at least in the MedStar system yet, but that is coming in the next month or so, just as a warning. Um, Have there been any cases either here or hospital center where it was in a COVID patient, there was enough to go into the cath lab for? I have not heard of anybody going specifically to the cath lab with COVID. I think they're trying to, um, I, I have not, I, I haven't asked over at hospital center specifically, but they have not reported anything specific like that in any of the um, uh, meetings that I've had with them. So you're thinking most of the, the leak is not um, atherosclerotic, all that kind, that kind of thing. So that's, so let me just go over a couple of these other cases that have been reported to kind of show what's been at least reported in the literature because that was one of the postulations as one of the mechanisms is acute coronary syndrome either from thrombosis increased, you know, hypercoagulable thrombosis risks and whatnot. But um, I think what's been mostly reported in the literature um, is that when they have taken the patient to cath lab, they usually have normal, they usually have normal and insignificant coronary disease and it's, and it's more likely a myocarditis that's going on. Uh, this particular case, 43-year-old woman who um, also had elevated troponins and uh, noted with some mild ST elevations, they actually, instead of taking the patient to the cath lab, they did a coronary CTA. And I think that's one of the uh, sort of things that people are recommending is um, doing a CTA, a coronary CTA to look for coronary artery disease. In this particular case, the echo showed mild LV dysfunction. There was some regional wall motion abnormalities. They did a CTA that also showed no significant coronary disease. But um, if you look at the image on the bottom, it showed a, the um, functional imaging showed that a suggestion of reverse tachycephal cardiomyopathy and that the bases were not contracting, but the apex was. <clears throat> this patient went on to have an MRI on day seven and uh, they showed on the edema imaging that there was evidence of edema in the, my in the myocardium, but on the fibrosis imaging, there was really no detectable scarring or necrotic foci. The patient also had a biopsy, and um, this showed diffuse T lymphocytic infiltrate infiltrates, interstitial edema, but only very limited foci of necrosis, so kind of going along with a more reversible cause. Um, there was no genome, no SARS-CoV-2 genome seen in the um, biopsy and no kind of like the, the normal typical pattern we see when there's my, myocardial necrosis, no contraction band necrosis or microvascular abnormalities. Um, they just, and they diagnosed this with acute virus negative but lymphocytic myocarditis. Uh, this patient got treated with uh, lopinavir and ritonavir as well as hydroxychloroquine and um, maintained normal function and CRP and high sensitivity troponin levels actually came down and patient got discharged home. Um, however, this study, which also they did a biopsy on the patient, they showed localization of the coronavirus within, um, within the, within the um, well, close to the myocardium. So this is a case out of Italy. Um, patient had high, increased high sensitivity troponin. And again, with the high sensitivity troponin values, you're gonna see like the thousands um, when it's really, really involved. This patient was um, actually very, uh, had a severe cardiac dysfunction, ended up on um, ECMO. Also had a calf that showed unremarkable coronary arteries. And that's kind of like the theme that we've been seeing here is like the calves tend to not show any um, significant um, blockages. Um, so they also did a biopsy and um, showed kind of similar to the study before that lo this low-grade interstitial and endomyocardial, endocardial inflammation, 
Um, but they actually saw small groups or single or groups of this vi the virus particles that seem to be morphology and size similar to coronaviruses. Um, but interestingly, the virus particles were noted in the interstitium. The myocardium, which actually in this um, slide on the left, which is next to it, actually just showed nonspecific features. They didn't see really virus particles or um, inflammation within the myocyte itself. It was really just in the interstitium. <clears throat> And then this case is, did show an evidence of coronary involvement. This was a patient reported, 55-year-old gentleman, um, only history of PAD, um, elevated high sensitivity troponin values, echo showed normal function, had a cath, and PDA was known to be occluded, and there was dissection involving the mid-RCA, which can be seen here by these arrows. Um, and this is... Um, kind of like an intraluminal view of the vessel showing the dissection flap in the coronary artery. So, so what I've seen so far from what's been reported in the literature, mostly myocarditis, pericarditis, as opposed to this acute coronary syndrome that we were expecting. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of patients, they did take, you know, they have these uh, wall motion abnormalities, they get taken to the cath lab, but most of them end up not having any significant coronary disease um, to explain their elevated troponins. And then what was interesting is like the inflammation, it seems to be limited to the interstitial regions of the heart as opposed to the virus directly um, attacking the myocardium itself. Um, the one study uh, did show that the coronavirus could be seen um, within the interstitium of the my, my, of the my, you know, next to the myocardium, but not necessarily within. Um, and then there hasn't been really, I couldn't find any significant vascularized or acute thrombosis of the coronary arteries reported um, in the literature. Although I, I don't know if there are um, anecdotal reports of this as well. Does that help answer some of your questions you had? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I guess the bottom line is we're still not exactly sure what's going on, although um, it does seem to be predominantly um, inflammatory or immune mediated in, as opposed to thrombus, um, acute coronary syndrome is thrombus related. But um, again, we're limited right now with just um, anecdotal reports and case reports. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be more coming out soon as um, given the number of cases um, that we, we're seeing now. All right, so then I'm an imaging person. So of course, um, and I think uh, Dr. Fisher was mentioning this. So what's the role of cardiovascular testing and imaging in these, in these patients? Obviously, we wanna treat these patients and we don't wanna um, give them, um, we wanna understand better what's going on. It's important in patients who have heart failure or arrhythmias, CG changes in cardiomegaly um, to kind of figure out, well, what's going on in the heart? Is there something different that we can do in our management and treatment plan? Um, this is kind of a protocol that was put out by the European Cardiology um, Society. And so if there's a question of cardiac imaging, they kind of created a flow chart here to evaluate the imaging, um, sorry, evaluate the indication. And if it's felt that imaging is needed to choose the imaging technique that's gonna have the lowest risk of contamination whenever possible. And only proceed with imaging if it's gonna likely change the patient's management. Um, and then they, you go down, it sort of talks about if the patient's COVID negative, you know, doing the cardiac imaging, but if they're positive or suspected positive, sort of choosing, um, trying to uh, better tailor, choosing between what type of imaging should be performed and what type of precautions for the um, personnel involved. Uh, summary of their advice. So first off, they say you shouldn't perform echo routinely in all the patients who have COVID-19. Um, that, but there could be a range of different manifestations that might require cardiac imaging. If you're going to do an echocardiogram, they recommend a focused cardiac ultrasound, mainly to decrease the duration of exposure. Um, TE, trying to avoid as much as possible in these patients, just because of the risk of contamination, both of the equipment and the personnel is very high since it is considered an aerosolizing procedure. And um, the use of chest CT, particularly when you if it can be combined with um, coronary or cardiac CT. Uh, um, and so if you're going to evaluate the pneumonia, maybe doing it co in conjunction with cardiac CT imaging to provide some synergistic um, information. In the presence of ACS, I think 
um, societies are recommending maybe coronary CTA, um, just again, minimizing the amount of risk to personnel um, compared to a cath lab um, versus a CT, um, CT suite. <clears throat> In patients who are already going to have um, a cath procedure, maybe doing the LV function by angiogram as opposed to exposing them to another cardiac procedure. Um, positive troponins and dysfunction or arrhythmias that can be suggestive of Takotsubo or myocarditis can be an indication of for acute MRI, but they only re recommend it if it's considered to be vitally important for the treatment and that the patient can be performed and transferred safely for the imaging procedure. When I tried to look into the, Amer the um, US guidelines, there isn't that much. The ASD echo did publish some echo guidelines in the setting of the outbreak. Sort of very similar, you're recommending focused exams for um, transthoracic echoes. TE, since they're high risk, consider uh, deferring whenever possible, um, unless it's absolutely indicated because of, it would uh, change the management. And let me just see how much time I have left. Okay. So some of the, so just because a lot of our patients are now getting treated with a lot of different types of medications, and some of these medications do have some potential cardiovascular effects, I thought I'd touch a little bit on these. Um, so um, these are sort of anti antiviral therapies that have been um, reported in the literature, ribavirin, lopinavir, ritonavir, um, remdem severe. I'm not sure if we're using either of these here, but most of, most of them, they don't have um, known effects for ribavirin or remdesivir, but for lopinavir and ritonavir, it has been associated with altered cardiac conduction, so QT prolongation, high degree AV block, and torsades, probably more so than some of the drugs that we are using here, actually. Um, the big one that we're using here, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, um, does it has been associated with direct myocardial toxicity versus in patients with cardiomyopathy, just exacerbation of that. And it can also alter the cardiac conduction, so causing um, AV block, bundle branch block, torsades, V-fib, um, or, or ventricular tachycardia. Um, some of these other therapies, I don't know if either of these are being used here. I think one of the other ones I've seen used here is um, can't pronounce it, tocilumab, <laughs> but can, uh, doesn't have any known effects on the QTC interval, but can um, be associated with hypertension and increased serum cholesterol. And so in this, um, in this study, they, um, sorry, in this recommendation paper, some of the recommendations that they um, give for if you are planning to start therapy is to think about the specific interactions if they are on um, other drugs that um, have a potential interaction, particularly those that can also, for, for the QT prolonging um, therapy, sorry, QT prolonging drugs, um, consideration on other drugs that could also potentially prolong the QTC. I'm just going to go to hydro chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, so cautiously with antiarrhythmics, um, and they have known specific interactions with beta blockers and other, as I mentioned, QT prolonging agents, and so to be careful in that setting. Um, so just a little bit about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. <clears throat> the only difference being um, in this um, um, attachment to the nitrogen group, but chloroquine, they're both been used to treat malaria, um, chloroquine also for um, amoebiasis and off-label treatment um, in por porphyria. Hydroxychloroquine um, used in malaria, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. They have been associated with QT prolongation, and it's been used as a surrogate for increased risk of drug-associated torsades, but the relationship is not, it's not like a linear or one-to-one -one relationship. Um, some drugs that have been associated with prolonged QT don't haven't necessarily been shown to increase um, or have increased um, evidence of torsades, but um, again, we use it kind of as a, um, a surrogate for a potential for torsades. Azithromycin, though, which is often used in combination with these um, with these drugs, macrolide antibiotic, it has been associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular deaths, which are presumed to be arrhythmic. Um, there hasn't been any studies suggesting that there's a synergistic effect, antiarrhythmic effect when used um, with chloroquine, but um, there are 
uh, there was one study that looked at risk factors that can be associated with arrhythmias with azithromycin, so female sex, older age, structural heart disease, using other QT prolonging drugs, um, hypokalemia and bradycardia. And um, finally, there's this uh, scoring system that has been used and sometimes been advocated for um, assessing the risk and de determining whether or not a patient should be started on some of these QT prolonging drugs. Um, again, takes into account some of the risk factors that I mentioned earlier, but assigns a risk score. Um, and those with, if you count up and it's more than 11 points, considered high risk and um, maybe might not want to start the drug. This is from um, North Shore University Hospital. It was published recently, a QTC flow chart um, when you're considering starting uh, chloroquine azithromycin. <clears throat> and again, kind of emphasizing the features or the risk factors I mentioned earlier, um, making sure that the mag and that the electrolytes are um, within um, normal range assessing the ECG and um, if they're lo and looking to see if they have a history of prolonged QT or other or on other meds that could prolong the QT. And I think most people use this 500 as kind of the cutoff value and in, um, in terms of uh, consideration or not to start or not or to carefully monitor and then once it's above 550 then to stop therapy um, as was seen in the Georgetown patient that I had recommended that I'd shown earlier. And then finally, I think this is my last few slides, but just ACE inhibitors and ARBs. I've had a few patients ask me about their, um, uh, since a lot of our heart failure patients are on ACE inhibitors or ARBs or our hypertensive patients. So is it safe in patients who have COVID or what's the data there? So there are kind of two prevailing hypotheses. One is that um, use of ACE inhibitors can increase viral binding. And this is um, um, showing it without, without an ACE or ARB, um, what normally happens um, where you have ACE2 that um, the virus can bind to and then get endothelialized. Um, and that with the presence of an ACE inhibitor, there may be increase in this ACE2 expression, which then could lead to increased viral binding. However, hypothesis two is that actually the inhibition, the RAS inhibition is actually protective in these patients. Um, and that at baseline, there's already increased um, lung injury um, <clears throat> with the um, ACE2 binding, which is tempered by um, angiotensin 2 and this angiotensin 1 through 7, which binds on this uh, MERS receptor and the angiotensin 2 receptor, which kind of um, one regulates the inflammation and one attenuates the inflammation fibrosis. And that with um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we actually get more um, attenuation of this inflammation and fibrosis and maybe actually protect it. So we're not sure. <laughs> right now there's no compelling evidence to stop an ACE inhibitor or ARB if a patient's already on it. And on the flip side, there's no compelling evidence actually to start it if a patient um, develops COVID that it has any benefit. We still just don't have um, data there yet with that. I think that's my, that's my last slide. I don't know if there's um, questions. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> we covered a couple and there's, there's one I'll ask you and if anyone wants to add more questions now, we can review them. But going back to um, when we were talking about the advanced imaging guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, it sounded like, for example, myocarditis, that you could get a cardiac MRI, but really only if you thought it would change management. Um, and so I don't know mm -hmm. if there's any scenarios that you can imagine that you think it would change management and what those would be. So I didn't touch on, you know, use of ECMO. I think it's, a, it's uh, we don't have it here, but, you know, we do have it at hospital center. Um, and that in general, when we um, here at MedStar, we're thinking about doing imaging or doing biopsies in patients, particularly the ones coming in with acute myocarditis or fulminant myocarditis, those are the ones we kind of want to identify really quickly because we want it to, um, to um, and they often are the ones that will end up needing um, advanced um, therapies to help maintain their uh, cardiac dysfunction in that setting. Um, the mild myocarditis cases, I'm, it's, again, I'm just trying to find my, um, my slide with the, where they talk about this. So positive troponins and myocardial dysfunction are severe arrhythmias. That, that one, I, I, was, I found that interesting because I think that's, so European guidelines um, or the European societies, they actually do a lot of cardiac MRI. Uh, it's, it's 
surprising how much more cardiac MRI they do there compared to what we do in the US. Um, and so I'm not sure if the US guidelines would, would indicate this as similarly, but it's part of, it's almost like their um, uh, routine, almost like they do that um, instead of stress echo or stress nuclear. That's how, that's how routine it is there. And so um, I think um, they are probably a bit more generous in recommending cardiac MRI than what I've seen here in the States. Not that, not that I say I don't disagree. I would wish we'd do more cardiac MRI here, but um, um, it's a little, like, I think it, it, a little bit has to do just culturally with how they approach cardiac imaging over there. They just tend to do it a lot more with uh, cardiac MR imaging compared to what we see here in the States. And um, a couple of more questions that are still along the myocarditis. It, any role of steroids in, in the COVID myocarditis? So steroids, I mean, I think probably the, um, I see people can speak to that because that's been, I didn't touch on that, but that's been very controversial as well. Um, I, I know that there's been data out there, like should you start steroids or not? And, and then kind of in the time course of it, um, where it would have benefit or not. I, I, don't, I don't think we have, we don't have the data there for that yet. And, you know, going back to ECMO or the need for ECMO, I actually heard a talk on this from an ICU doctor, but um, from New York that really they have, it was a center that had ECMO, but they didn't want to use it because I guess it uh, really takes a lot of nursing in and out. And so they were kind of wary about the PP aspect, but I don't know if you've been hearing that ECMO in fulminant COVID myocarditis has actually had good outcomes. In general, and good I mean, I, with ECMO is always relative, I'm sure. But I know I was going to say because I think in general I even heard great outcomes with ECMO, and that's um, we're not doing it so much here. Although I think GW does it a lot more. I know my husband um, says they send they've sent several patients to GW for ECMO. Um, mm. it, we again, as I said, we have not been pushing it or doing it a lot here. Um, but and then the data that I see on it seems like it's. I mean, granted, the fact that you need ECMO already indicates that you have a pretty severe form of the disease. Um, the outcomes don't look so great. Um, I, I don't, have I'm, not, I'm not up to date on that data. Yeah, I haven't heard. And then LVADs, do they have any role, you think? Oh, I haven't heard too much about use of LVADs in this setting. Again, most of the data, at least what's been reported, the LV dysfunction seems to be reversible. Um, and the so, uh, but I haven't, I haven't heard of it being used like in that, because um, I think by the time they get to that sort of kind of near fatal, you know, event, right, I don't know if people are been putting it in or I think just because of the risk with um, exposure and whatnot and personnel and PPE. Yeah. Um, and I'm, somebody asked about the magnesium. I think we should be, should we be checking on every COVID patient? And I think the answer is yes. I think so too. Yeah, I think hopefully we are. Arrhythmia risk. And then this is just a general cardiology question. What do you have a different cutoff for the QTC that's abnormal for a male and a female? Um, reportedly there is, but we haven't. I mean, nobody's. Uh, people are pretty much using um, kind of like the 500 and uh, and 550, regardless. And so, if you see 520, it's you would monitor but you wouldn't necessarily stop any therapy at that point. Is that the way I interpret that? Correct. Although okay. I think, I, I mean, I, we haven't been the ones controlling the, um, high, you know, controlling whether it gets sure, stopped sure. or not. It's the ID, ID folks. Um, as I said, it's, it's not a linear relationship. So just because your QT is ra raising, I think they've been um, not necessarily stopping the hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, but maybe holding on the azithromycin. I think that's what I've, I've just like in the case I showed, I think it's mostly the azithromycin that um, has been held if the QTC is prolonging. Do you trust the um, QTC measurement from the from the machine? Um, not always, <laughs> um, and unfortunately, because we don't get the indications for the EKGs, and I can't measure like QTCs on every single patient. But if I knew like this was specifically a COVID patient EKG, then I might be a little bit more. Um, uh, cautious about measure, you know, measuring it. But I, unfortunately, when we get the EKGs to review, we don't, we don't necessarily get the, indi the specific indication. Um, hmm. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Okay. Um,
Again, thank you for your time and putting this together in short notice. Uh, no, very no interesting problem. stuff. I learned a lot from it too. <laughs> yeah.